All right, so we're going to start um, our lesson um, where it should have ended uh, last last week. But uh, I toyed with it over the week as to whether this is really important to, to cover. But I thought at least it helps us uh, see the importance of comparing the scriptures, uh, the three gospels we call the synoptic, synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, very similar, and John is not. And so, of course, we're going through the Gospel of John, so it's important when we look at how do the uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke take uh, an instance, and what does uh, John add to it? This is the, one of the only occasions in the four Gospels where it's the same scene being recorded. Uh, so that's why I wanted to do this. So real quickly, I'm going to go through this. Um, it's in all four Gospels. I know you probably can't see this unless you're up front. Um, I don't think I can see it up front. All right. So this is from Matthew. Uh, we're just going to read Matthew, then I'll bring the others in. Uh, now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the full of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Uh, that's from uh, Matthew. Uh, Mark's Gospel. Um, here's some of the additions and some of the differences. Uh, he includes the word Bethany. So Mark, Matthew says, uh, as they were going through Beth, Bethphage, and uh, Mark, for whatever reason, adds... Uh, Bethany. Well, just from a map perspective, uh, here's Jerusalem, here's Bethany, which of course we know, uh, we just talked about that, where Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and Simon, this, uh, the, the no, leper one. Okay. So here's Bethany, here's Bethphage, and then here's, it's about a three mile hike from Bethany over the mountain, basically, into uh, Jerusalem. And, and Bethany and Bethphage, it's kind of hard to see on this map, but are kind of sister villages. Not cities, villages. And I was thinking in terms of something like Chandler and Boonville. You know, that kind of, they're, they're close enough, but they're, they're separate villages, separate towns. Uh, and so I wanted to put this picture up too to see this is the Mount of Olives. We'll get back to here in, in a few minutes. And this is called the Kidron Valley. It is actually a valley. And I'll show you a picture, a modern picture, where if you're on the Mount of Olives and you're looking over Jerusalem, you can actually see uh, this valley. So it's not a, not a terrible walk, three miles. But it's an up and down type thing. Um, what else was added? Uh, notice that Matthew says uh, they found a, a donkey tied in a colt. Mark and Luke, we'll see Luke here in a few minutes. Uh, Mark and Luke just say what? A colt. So for whatever reason, Matthew gives us information that there was a, a mama, probably, donkey, and a baby colt, a foal. Uh, and so I don't know why that was added, but... Um, Mark tells us that nobody's ever sat on this colt. Nobody's ever rode this uh, beast of burden. Um, um, and then Matthew gives us, uh, remember Matthew, if you know about Matthew, he's uh, always trying to point us back to the Old Testament. Matthew is writing to Jews, and he wants them to know the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. And so it makes sense that in Matthew's gospel, he refers us back to this uh, passage. Does anybody know what book that's from? Which prophet? It's read every Palm Sunday. Zechariah. The only time you ever hear Zechariah read in church usually is, is this Palm Sunday passage. Uh, and then uh, Matthew, uh, Mark says, uh, some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing on time? So Jesus predicted this would happen. Somebody's going to approach you and say, why are you taking this colt? Only Mark tells us that actually happened. That's just, this actually did take place. Somebody asked, what are you doing? And they said, teacher wants it. Okay. And then they move on. Uh, Matthew, in this, uh, the crowd shouting Hosanna, uh, or shouting Son of David, um, in Mark's Gospel, uh, they refer to it as our Father David, so there's some changes there. 
one thing also I want to point out, Matthew and Mark both tell us the crowds that went before him and the crowds that followed him. So think about Jesus on a colt, and there's a group of people in front of him that are kind of leading the way, and there's a group of people behind him that are following. So that's a crowd. We're going to see in the Gospel of John, there's more to come than just those people. The whole city was stirred up. Who is this? Uh, Mark simply says that he enters Jerusalem, uh, goes to the temple, all things are quiet, and then he goes back to uh, Bethany, which is kind of strange if you know the chronology here. Um, maybe this was Jesus going in and seeing the temple, and then what does he do later in that week with the temple? Goes in and cleans it, cleanses it. Okay. So Mark kind of gives us the idea that he goes in, Palm Sunday goes in, looks at the temple, oh, what a mess. Goes back to Bethany, and then later, a few days later, goes back to the temple and clears it. The uh, Apostle John in his gospel has the clearing of the temple take place early on in his gospel. So it's like Jesus did it twice. Early on, the first time he went down to Jerusalem, and then now the last time, according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, oh, by the way, uh, another chronology issue is Matthew, Mark, and Luke have Jesus coming in Palm Sunday and, and stating that kind of their home base in Bethany, which is just, a you know, like I said, a few miles away. But after he comes into Palm Sunday, goes back to Bethany, then they have Mary anointing, or Matthew, Mark, have Mary anointing his feet with perfume. They have that taking place during Holy Week. Whereas uh, John has it taking place six days before Holy Week. So... Um, and then Luke, um, Luke adds, uh, remember Luke's writing to Gentiles. Um, it's interesting here, uh, Jesus sits on the donkey. Actually, that says here what? Uh, where is it at? He sits on both, according to this, right? He says... Um, Down the next paragraph. Down the next paragraph. Yeah, that's right. uh, they brought the donkey and the colt and put him on them, their cloaks, and he sat on them. So he sat on the cloaks, but... Uh, so you've got both of them being present here in Matthew. Mark just has one, uh, but the idea is that Jesus is stepping up and sitting on them. But here, in the Luke, they say they set Jesus <coughs> on them. I don't know what that means. I mean, they helped him up or whatever. Uh, just the difference. Uh, notice in Matthew and Mark, they uh, wave branches. What kind of branches? Palm branches. Oh, you don't know that from Matthew and Mark. Mm -hmm, but we do it every Sunday. Matthew and Mark don't say what branches they are, just says leafy branches. Could be could be maples. <laughs> so where do we get palm branches? Hold that thought. I said hold that thought. Uh, Luke, Luke doesn't uh, tell us anything about uh, that necessarily. Luke says a whole multitude of disciples. This is a big crowd of people. Um, voice uh, because of all they had seen. So you think about the People are going before Jesus. The people that are coming after Jesus. They had seen the miracles. They're eyewitnesses, and that's why that multitude was so large. Um, they call him King. And then this verse from Luke: "Peace in heaven and glory in the highest." Have you heard that before? Mm -hmm. Where? When? Angels. When? At the birth. At the birth. And who recorded that? Luke. Luke. It's in Luke's account of the the birth of Jesus. So there's a parallel here. Jesus is born, and the angels proclaim, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. And when Jesus enters Jerusalem, they say, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Uh, there's a kind of a bracketing here. Um, and then he says at the end, this is the only time it's recorded where the Pharisees, religious leaders, are like, Tell your disciples to stop calling you the Messiah. Stop worshiping you as king. And what does Jesus say? Well, I could tell them not to, but these little stones would cry out. Interesting. Creation itself would attest to my uh, messiahship, my kinghood. Okay, now let's jump over to the whole point of that was to see what, what does John offer us. Um, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found, found a young he found a young donkey and sat on it. Just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming and sitting on a donkey's colt. 
So just initially, some of the changes. Now, don't get, I'm not trying to get you all tripped over here. The scriptures con you know, conflict with each other, and there's contradictions. But these are different perspectives of the same event. Uh, and so, of course, John knows, we're going to see here, uh, you know, John knows where he found the donkey or how he found the donkey. It was given to him. You know, they, uh, somebody went into the city and got this. Uh, well, he may not have known that, though. He, right, where it came he might have just told a couple of other right. disciples to go and do that. That's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the first thing I want to point out here is um, they took the palm branches and they went out to meet him. Who's the they? The crowd. The crowd. Which crowds? <coughs> this is a different crowd. <coughs> These are the ones who had come for the feast. These are the people from Jerusalem. You know, pilgrims that had come to the feast and they were ready to celebrate the Passover and they're the ones, it says, John says here, who grabbed the palm branches and wave. So you got, uh, we'll talk about this, you got a couple crowds here. You got Jesus coming from Bethany, a crowd in front of him, a crowd behind him. They get close to Jerusalem and guess who's waiting for them? Another crowd with palm branches and maybe, hey, I got some extra, you take some. Or whatever. Um, and why did the crowd from this, these pilgrims there for the Passover feast go out uh, to meet him? Because they had heard about Lazarus. They had heard about it. Um, that he had done this sign, this miracle. So you have those who had seen the miracle, were eyewitnesses to it, coming to those who had heard about it. They travel all the way to Jerusalem. So you have these crowds uh, that get together. Two crowds um, those from Bethany uh, who witnessed the raising of Lazarus, those from Jerusalem uh, who came for the feast, and this is where it all, right outside the gates, you have this, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people all there to welcome him, uh, shouting Hosanna. Okay. So and the reason why I wanted you to see that is just to understand when we get to Palm Sunday every year, uh, we usually just read the Matthew or the Mark gospel. Why? Shorter. It's short. Yeah, it's just be honest. It's short, okay? Uh, but there's a lot of stuff in each of these four Gospels. Uh, this one, I just, I put this up. I'm just going to skip through it. But opposition grows. Uh, this is from John. Let's just move on here. So now back to our lesson for today. The night when Jesus was betrayed. Uh, we're told that uh, in Matthew 26. Uh, this is called the first uh, day of the unleavened bread. Um, and then... Um, Mark and Luke tell us it's customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb on this. This is called the 14th of Nisan. Every year, the 14th of Nisan is when uh, the Jews would, um, this is prescribed in, in, the, in the Old Testament commands. They would go find a perfect lamb and sacrifice it in the temple, and the fourth of, 14th of Nisan would change into the 15th of Nisan when? Sundown. Sundown, right. At sundown, and that sundown is it's making that change from 14 to 15. That's when they have the Passover feast. And so then seven days after that, uh, 14th through the 21st of Nisan, is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's a holy, holy time. Um, so this is from Matthew. He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. Uh, and the sign was, Mark tells us that uh, Jesus tells him, you're going to find a man carrying a jar of water. He will show you uh, the place where you should meet, and it's going to be prepared for the meal. Well, why is that significant? Why is that an identifying thing? Women usually carry it. Yeah, finding a man, I mean, I don't want to overstate that, but I think that's why Mark includes it and why Jesus includes it. Uh, it's going to be obvious to you there's going to be a man going through the marketplace with a large jar, jar of water. You don't normally see that. So if you see that, uh, that's a clue. Follow him. And some have speculated, uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, that that might have actually been Mark's father. Uh, John Mark's father. Uh, many people think that the upper room of the Lord's Supper was Mark's house. John Mark's house. Okay. Um, so who are these disciples? Luke says they're Peter and John. Actually identifies them. Jesus says, Peter and John, go get this uh, Lord's Supper. Get, I'm sorry, get the place for the Passover ready. Why doesn't John say that? Why does it sound like, hey, he talked to me and Peter and he went and got everything ready? It's not important really to the story here, but Luke, Luke includes it. So he's with the twelve. 
I get asked that a lot. Who was in the upper room with Jesus? Were the women who had traveled with him from Galilee? Were they uh, gathered up there? What about the owner of the house? The host of the house? Was he with them? Uh, but all three Gospels tell us he's with the twelve. This is a private uh, Passover meal. The rest of the family had their own Passover meal in some other part of the house. Uh, but this was just privately with the twelve. Uh, we call this the Lord's Supper. We got the matzah bread. And then the drop the, the cups of wine. The words of institution are recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And also in 1 Corinthians. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, writing earlier. Uh, 1 Corinthians was probably written around maybe 55. Uh, uh, Paul's writing 1 Corinthians, already aware of the gospel being circulated, already knowing uh, Jesus' words of institution. But then the question becomes, why didn't John put this important information in his gospel? When, we, when you read today, you started with what? The foot washing. That's how it started. Okay, but why is there nothing in there about the actual feast? Why did John not record the words of it? These are critical for us as a church, these words of institution. Uh, how Jesus takes this Passover meal and applies it to himself. Why did John not include that? Guesses? The church already knew. John's writing his gospel, we believe, about the year 90, 95. The gospels have been written in the, in the 50s. And it was already widely known. Even by, uh, or by Paul in 55, 60, this was generally understood. The night when Jesus was betrayed, unleavened bread, Jesus did these words of institution. So remember, John is writing his gospel in some ways to supplement what the people already knew and to enhance it. Because the foot washing, which comes up here next, is not recorded in the other three gospels. So it's just, I, I think it's important for us to kind of understand the gospel that we know, and a lot of times the gospel accounts in our brains, it's all kind of, it's all mashed together. Um, but it didn't come to us originally like that. So what does the Apostle John add to these events? Um, uh, as the evening meal was being served, so this is it's a big meal. And so they got everything prepared for it. And so as the servants are probably bringing stuff up, Jesus uh, does something different than they were expecting. Uh, he washes his disciples' feet. Um, and uh, whose job is that usually? Servants. Servants, servants yeah. When they came into the house, uh, if this is John Mark's house, whoever's house, when they came into the house, the servants must have been there, ready to wash their feet. That's their job. So why didn't they wash their feet? Why, why are the disciples' feet still dirty when they got to the upper room, do you think? This is just reading between the lines. They didn't have, they were... They rented this room, or they got this room. It could itself. be because the servants, you know, were instructed to do that. Why else, maybe? Jesus didn't work. Yeah, it's quite possible. That's my mind. When I'm, it's not saying in the scriptures, it's possible that Jesus got there first, or whatever, and said to the servants, "Just I got this," because this is intentional on Jesus's part. So he must have stopped uh, the normal process because he wants to do this himself. So why does Jesus want to wash their feet? John introduces this section with a very important verse uh, to show them the extent of his love. Uh, and though, boy, are they going to need to know his love in the next several hours. But to show his, the extent of his love, he uh, kneels down and washes, uh, washes their feet. Um, uh, notice the significance of the water here. I'm asking you to remember a lot here, uh, but remember the Gospel of John is water-soaked water soaked um, with John the Baptist of course the water of baptism uh, the wedding at Cana remember the water there used uh, to change water into wine uh, Nicodemus what about the water with Nicodemus worship sale yeah uh, unless you are born again of water and of the spirit he tells Nicodemus born again well do I have to go back into my mama uh, and he says no I want to talk about a physical rebirth here, but a, a spiritual rebirth of the spirit and the water. Uh, the woman at the well, that's John, the pool of Bethesda, 
where uh, the paralyzed man was by the edge of it and he couldn't get in when the water was stirred somehow. And then Jesus uh, heals him. Uh, Jesus walks on water, uh, the pool of Siloam. We talked about that last week. That's the blind man who uh, Jesus gives sight to. He says, now go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Uh, and uh, Jesus says in uh, chapter 7, kind of tying this all together, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from him. Now, talking about a physical water, but he's equating here uh, to when you're not believing, you are a dehydrated desert. When you're not a believer, if you want to say it that way. But those who believe in me, spiritually, you are well enough to eternal life through the living water that I give. And this is exactly, in some ways, what he's saying to Peter. And remember when Peter, he's washing Peter's feet, and Peter says what? Don't do it, wash your feet. No, don't do it. I should be washing your feet. And what does Jesus respond? Unless I wash you, you can have no part with me. Unless I forgive your sins and wash you clean from your sins and give you that living water that will well up into you, you can have no part with me. And what's Peter's response? Wash my whole body. Give me a bath. <laughs> Jesus is like, I'm not talking about physical water. <laughs> So this is the account of washing of the feet is only in John. Uh, only in John. Um, <clears throat> so what about the seating arrangement? I don't know if you thought about this as you were reading through John's account. Remember, John's an eyewitness here. Uh, the seating arrangement. Here's a picture of uh, the Last Supper from Leonardo da Vinci. He started it in 1495, finished it. In, have ever, has anybody seen this? Well, seen it live? <laughs> How big is it? Yeah, it's of that wall, yes, right. Um, and so this is, uh, obviously, it's a computer uh, enhanced. But uh, so looking at this, of course we know that Jesus, when he's serving the Lord's Supper, they're not at a straight table, okay? They're probably U-shaped, like that. Well, that's not even U anymore, no. He get probably a low to the ground, U-shaped. He's at the head of the table. He's got one to his right, one to his left, and spread out. Uh, but, you know, when you're going to paint that, it's kind of hard to paint that. Um, he, and he made this up. Da Vinci made this he did this. Yeah, he was, he was totally wrong on this. Right. Um, but okay, so when you look at his picture, uh, which we often associate with the Lord's Supper, uh, we'll see he has John on the on the left, on his right, uh, because of the Gospel of John, the one who reclined on Jesus. Well, it has to be someone close to Jesus. So we have John here on the right. Uh, he has uh, Peter right here. We know it's Peter. Can't really tell unless you're looking real hard. He's got a sword behind his back. He's got a dagger. Uh, so that's how Peter's identified here. Uh, remember, Peter in Gospel of John says, when Jesus says, somebody's going to betray me, and Peter leans over to John and says, find out who he's talking about. So that's kind of the conversation here. Uh, but Leonardo da Vinci uh, puts Judas right here in the middle of him. He's holding a, you can't really see it, but it's a money bag. So Leonardo's uh, depiction here, you've got John, Peter, uh, which makes sense, but Judas right in the middle of them. I'm not so, I mean, he's a great artist and all, but I have, I have little concerns with that because why would Peter kind of push Judas out of the way and say, tell, tell me who he's talking about? You know, it's almost, it just seems like, oh, all right. I think typically history has shown that, uh, well, Jesus even says, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot. I, I, this is just me speculating. But if I'm sitting at a table and, uh, and I've got my bread and I've got my, my dish in front of me, you dip your bread, I'm not going to dip the bread and go, pass John and Peter and give it to Judas. All right, so it had to be somebody, in my mind, next to Jesus. And that's why a lot of people kind of felt that Judas should actually be right over here. If that's the case, think about that. John on one hand, Judas on the other, positions of honor. And I know in your uh, small groups you talked about how Jesus labored in love for the sake of Judas, trying to help him overcome the devil who had already entered him. Uh, and so it makes sense that Jesus puts John, uh, Judas right here. Now, Testing your knowledge of St. Paul's architecture, at our altar, we have the Lord's Supper. 
base of the altar. Have you looked at it close enough? Do you know where Judas is at? On the end. Dude. He's on the end. Yeah. On our altar. Now you're not going to be paying attention at all in church next week. You're going to be looking around at the altar. <laughs> he's on the end, on the right. If you're facing the altar, he's on the right, and he's very visibly holding the money bag. He's down here. And a lot of paintings have that. Um, and that's almost as if to say, if we could get him out of the picture, we would. We've got to kind of have him in there because you have to have the 12. And our altar also, um, it's not a painting. It's actually a sculpting or a relief. Uh, there's, um, there's a flask of uh, a, a jar and a basin right over here, which is the washing of the feet, I think, symbol. Over here, there's a whole basket of bread. And uh, there's something... I, you guys can crawl around in the altar if you want. Okay. I did this early this morning just to verify. There's something over here next to the water. I don't quite understand. I can't really tell because it's, you know, it's 120 years. How old is the church? 115 years old. So it looks like maybe grapes on a vine. Uh, but anyway, that's all our altar. Uh, so uh, John kind of gives us this, I think, um, seating position uh, better than the other disciples. Probably John on the right. Probably Judas on the left. Um, Would you go back to that picture again? I only see 11 people. Well, what is 11 that? disciples. What did I do? I went too far. Did you, see count? Count? did you count them? She counted them. I no, 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 no. We're going to go back. <laughs> Practice our math. I don't know why I went that far back. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's one kind of obscured, kind of obscured here a little bit. Well, Judas is kind of leaning on the table. Yeah, Judas down here. Oh, I see. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I just didn't see Judas. Yeah, he's leaning on. He's leaning on. Honestly, I bet how many times you've counted that. I get. I probably when you went and saw the big one, I was like, really twelve. Okay, where were we? I count them. I want to know if Judas was still there. <laughs> All right. When they assigned him, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Uh, that's from Matthew and Mark. Uh, Luke says, as usual. That's kind of an important point. Uh, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Luke says, they always did this. Uh, it's very common. So the question was asked last week by somebody, uh, what's the whole point of Judas betraying? If... If they commonly went to the Mount of Olives, then why do the soldiers need somebody to lead them? That's a fair question. Except that uh, the Mount of Olives, now this is late at night. Everybody's back in their, uh, Passover is over, so most people are back in their homes, undid their belt loops because their bellies are full, or maybe even sleeping. Uh, so it's late at night. Uh, but the Mount of Olives, uh, I'll show you just that, is a big place. Uh, and so where did Jesus normally go? He probably had a certain spot picked out. Not, I mean, the soldiers could be walking around the Mount of Olives for hours trying to find uh, where he's at. Uh, but um, there's a usual spot that they went to that only Judas would know. Um, so here is uh, Bethphage, Bethany. Here's the Mount of Olives. It is actually a mountain. Well, I'm from Colorado, so it's not really a mountain. But, uh, <laughs> It's an upraised uh, uh, hill, um, and here's a picture, if you can see it. Here's a picture from the Mount of Olives. Here's Jerusalem, and you can kind of see how uh, you go down in this valley. It's a big place, so lots of olives. Uh, of course, the Garden of Gethsemane will know uh, where he ends up. But uh, <coughs> This is what's unique about John. If you just read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you would think, Passover, Jesus gives the words of institution, Right, and there's a discussion about uh, somebody's going to betray me, uh, and there's no, there's certainly not me. And you get Peter coming in and saying, "I will always stand next to you. I'll never fail." And then Jesus says, "You're going to deny me three times." You're familiar with that story that night he's betrayed. And it, and if you just read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you would see they'd get all done with that. Uh, they'd sing a hymn. Uh, what's what's what hymn? I don't know. Mighty fortress. My <laughs> they probably didn't sing stricken, smitten, and afflicted. They didn't get that. Maybe they, I don't know, with him that was uh, popular in those days, abide with me, I don't know. Uh, but uh, they sung a hymn, and then they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's how Matthew, Mark, and Luke progress. 
John, however, gives us the rest of the story. Uh, from chapter 14 to chapter 17, if you have your Bibles, in your Bibles, uh, a lot of our Bibles have red letters for Jesus when he's teaching whatever. If you look at that, 14, 15, 16, and 17 is all red letters. And that's all in the upper room. So it's not just a dinner and go to Gethsemane. It's a dinner and discussion. And there's prayer. Uh, some of our favorite verses come from this section, these uh, verses, these chapters. So Jesus is not done teaching yet. He shows them the extent of his love. He washes their feet. He does the, uh, changes the Passover into the Lord's Supper for them. Um, and, then, uh, and then he teaches them still about the kingdom. Uh, and uh, uh, Carol did a good job in her class bringing this up. I, I, it's something I had talked about in our um, Lifeline Leaders. Chapter 4 begins, um, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in me. Trust also in God. Now, they're probably thinking, well, why would our hearts be troubled? We're having a meal with Jesus. <clears throat> we talked about us betraying him, but we don't know that's really going to happen. We're all going to stand up for you, Jesus. And Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. It's just hours from the cross. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back for you to take you to be with me, that where I am, you may be also. That actually uh, is, um, is marriage language. Uh, when the bridegroom would be, be betrothed to his bride, the groom, would they'd have a ceremony kind of, uh, of engagement, and then the groom would retreat and build his, so he'd leave his father's house, his uh, parents' house, and start building his own house, uh, a future house. And he would build that house, and when he had got that home done, then he would go back across town, village or whatever, and there'd be a wedding ceremony uh, with the bride, and then he would lead the bride to his house. That's the marriage uh, imagery that's throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. And so when Jesus is saying this, and John's recording it for us, that's exactly what's going on. Jesus is saying to them, I'm about to leave. <coughs> but remember, when a bridegroom goes <coughs> to prepare a house, the bridegroom does what? Returns back. And that's why they can be not worried. Not troubled. Because as soon he's going to be taken from them, as soon he will come back, uh, that they would be taken to be with him, as, as you and I will as well. Uh, and uh, so that conversation, uh, I'm the vine, you are the branches, we're going to talk about that next week. All this stuff right there. This is in the upper room. And then when they get done with that conversation, that prayer, he prays for them, he prays for unbelievers in the world, he plays, prays for the church, and when he's done that, then they leave. And then go to the Garden of Gethsemane where he's, uh, of course, we know the rest of the, after that. Any questions about that? All right. That should get you set up for next week. Thank you for letting me go a little bit, uh, well, it's not long now, but a little bit extra time in the beginning. So let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we do thank you for the Gospel of John that gives us a little bit more of a, of a, a glimpse into your heart uh, for your disciples that you loved all of them, um, even Judas, you washed his feet. And even Peter, uh, who would deny you. Lord Jesus, you loved all of your disciples. You washed their feet, and then you willingly uh, walked that distance to the cross where you'd be crucified for their sins. And not just their sins, but also for us. For you have shown us the full extent of your love as well. Uh, you have forgiven our sins when we deny you, when we betray you, when we uh, ignore you and, just, and neglect your word. Uh, you have died on the cross for us, uh, and you have given us a new life. You have washed us and made us clean and filled us with the living water. Help us, Lord, to allow that water to spill over into our lives, that we'd always be faithful uh, to you and faithful to proclaiming uh, the message of your love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.